Welcome back to our series on important Galicianers of the past two centuries. Revolutions in orthodoxy, seemingly a paradox, but this has actually deep roots in Galicia. Already in the 1870s, the first political orthodox party, Machsikea Das, was founded in the province, who also founded a newspaper by the same name, the Defenders of the Faith. The paradox of fighting for orthodoxy through modern political means. And this brings us to our person for today, Sara Schneer, a pioneering founder of the base Yaakov Orthodox school system for girls. And today we can only touch on some of her biography. I can't emphasize enough how important she was and what she accomplished. Schneer was born in Krakow, the third of nine children to a Bell's Hasidic family with ties also to the Sans Hasidim. And Bell's and Sans are two of the most important Hasidic groups in Galicia, especially Bell's. The family owned a dry goods store and were extremely devout Hasidim with rabbinic heritage, with rabbinic yichas. Her siblings, two predeceased her and the rest were murdered in the Holocaust, ranged from also being devout Hasidim to entirely secular, which wasn't so uncommon at the time. Schneer finished her studies in a government-sponsored primary school, which I'll speak about in a second, but that means only through the eighth grade, and then compelled by financial stress, has to start work as a seamstress while educating herself in Jewish philosophy and scripture, especially being influenced eventually by the writings of Samson Raphael Hirsch. She was a brilliant autodidact, learning widely Jewish sources, mostly in Yiddish, but also secular sources, a German and Polish literature, and attending public lectures and plays. This is not at all shocking for the period, and particularly the public schools. There was a system that evolved in Galicia in the 1880s and 1890s, actually pushed by someone we've spoken about, Aaron Marcus. And here was the problem. The government required that all children attend public schools, but the, the more religious families didn't want to send their sons to those schools, they preferred the religious schools. So they advocated sending the daughters, let them go to the free public school, they will fill up all of the seats, there will not be room left for the sons, and thereby you avoid the law without paying any kind of fine. Uh, over time, this leads to a crisis, because increasingly the, the daughters of these families are getting a secular education, learning Polish, and having their eyes open to the modern world, and the sons are not, and there's a mismatch between them. Uh, Marcus himself, after a number of years, realizes the mistake and starts arguing against it. There was actually a rabbinical conference in Krakow in 1903 in which he and others proposed the idea of a girls' school network to counteract this problem, but it was rejected. Schneer herself re was extremely religious, but felt that the Orthodox world lacked resources for women with her religious and intellectual passions, and she particularly resented that Hasidic spirituality was virtually unavailable to women. Indeed, it was detrimental to them in some ways as their husbands and fathers left their families to be at the Hasidic courts. Schneer fled Vienna to Vienna in 1914 after the outbreak of World War I with hundreds of thousands of other Galicians, but returns to Krakow the next summer where she organizes a group of girls and taught them Jewish studies. How does she come to do this, let alone succeed, as we'll see in a few minutes? She concluded that an effective struggle against secularization and acculturation among Jewish women, uh, a particularly Galician struggle, must begin with educational activity among the younger age groups. And she proposed the idea of establishing Orthodox schools for girls. She had actually been toying with the idea for some years in Krakow, but was particularly inspired in Vienna with, by her exposure to neo-orthodoxy. And there she describes in her memoirs a sermon by Rabbi Moshe David Flesh that she heard about Judith seizing the moment out of need to save Jewry as the spark that set her off. And she spent months studying with that rabbi, particularly the teachings of Samson Raphael Hirsch before returning to Krakow. She had first organized a public meeting of Orthodox women and founded the Orthodox Girls' Union. She stops working as a dressmaker and devotes her time to lecturing and assembling an Orthodox lending library. But she's dissatisfied with the fact that the adolescents she manages to reach are uninterested in strict religious observance, and she decides to work with younger girls instead. In 1917, her brother advises her to get support from the Rebbe of Bells, Yisachar Davrokeach, whose picture you see there. 
She travels to him with her brother in Marienbad and writes the following note. She wants, her brother is to say, writes the following note. She wants to lead Jewish girls along a Jewish path. That was it. And they receive his response, blessing and success. Note the cryptic note. No great details about what she's doing. It's really important that we re-emphasize the extent of this revolution and the resistance to it. There was tremendous resistance to the idea of girls at Jewish girls' education. For example, in 1909, after two great granddaughters of the Sanzer Rebbe abandoned the Orthodox world, the Ger Hasidim of Krakow adopted new regulations forbidding girls from attending school beyond the seventh grade, speaking Polish on the Sabbath, attending the theater, or even learning Hebrew. Another example, among the Hungarian followers of the Chatam Sofer, rabbis exhorted the community not only to restrict girls' secular education, but also to find ways to keep them within the confines of their homes. Also in Hungary, there was a 1924 book on the subject of raising daughters, denying the halachic permissibility of organized Jewish education for girls altogether. The famous Talmudic aphorism that says teaching girls Torah was teaching licentiousness was difficult to overcome. Orthodoxy was slowly changing, with men like the Chafetz Chaim suggesting limited education, but it was really the influence of German neo-orthodoxy that gave the revolutionary model. The chaos and challenges during World War I and the challenges of the new Polish state was part of the shakeup that allowed these changes to happen. But there were also advantages to her as a woman that allowed her brilliance, her willingness to act, and her organizational talent to succeed where a similarly placed and talented man might not have. For example, the same marginality of women that allowed them temporal freedom to acculturate also gave them freedom to strengthen orthodoxy if they so chose. For example, religion and politics overlapped in Galicia, especially between the Hasidic courts, let alone outside them. Women being outside that structure did not have any single court attached to them. There was no single court attached to her movement, not even bells, that would have necessitated a knee-jerk rejection by the others. In other words, women had an ecumenical advantage over men. She could also get endorsements without the halachic argumentation that dogged men looking to launch such schools. Recall the very vague phrasing of her note to the Belzer Rebbe. She never mentioned in all of her speeches the famous Talmudic aphorism against women, lear women learning Torah, something that would have been impossible for a man to avoid. Plus, she avoided the prohibition anyway because it spoke about fathers teaching Torah. And her system saw women teachers, implying a more voluntary Torah education that doesn't distract men from their own learning obligations. We know from the rare occasions that she absolutely had the erudition and knowledge to argue the halacha. She consciously avoided it as much as possible, thereby not infringing on the male space while she accomplished what she wanted to accomplish. She opened a girls' school in her apartment, calling it Base Yaakov. I'll discuss the name in a minute. The institution offered free Jewish education to 25 girls from Hasidic families who otherwise studied in the government-sponsored schools, and it grew rapidly. From there, with her travels, it spread quickly across Poland and Lithuania. By 1924, there were 54 schools with over 5,000 students. By 1929, there were 146 schools, although these numbers fluctuated with schools opening and closing quite rapidly. Most important was the teacher's seminary she opened in her apartment in 1923, which acquired its own premises two years later. Her program was supported by a number of Orthodox activists in Krakow and was endorsed by the Krakow chapter of Agudis Yisrael in 1919, which assumed uh, financial responsibility and confirmed the name. The name, by the way, Beit Yaakov Lechuvan Elcha, comes from that verse. The house of Jacob, let us rise up and go in the light of God. It was the same verse that was used by the Bilu movement, the early Zionist movement of the 1880s uh, that suggested young people should get up and go to Palestine, a very popular verse uh, for those times. 
After the Aguda agrees to sponsor a national network of schools in 1922, Schneer travels widely to lecture, founding schools throughout Poland and winning the support of Aguda Sisral members in numerous communities. In 1925, she also helps found the educational and social organization Benos Aguda Sisral, Daughters of Aguda Sisral, for graduates of the Beis Yaakov system. She was a prolific writer of articles, scripts for Beis Yaakov school plays, letters to individuals, the first Beis Yaakov textbook, and more. Her collected writings first appeared in 1933 and were later reissued. It's, it's difficult to overstate the, rapi the rapidness of the system's growth, and not just schools and seminaries, also the emergence of newspapers, textbooks, and organizations to support the system over its first years. These papers are vital new media by and for Orthodox Jewish girls to express themselves. She also created physical space and community for women to express themselves as a religious collective, either in the schools or the adjacent spaces or traveling together in cities or in nature. By 1933, Beis Yaakov includes 265 schools and almost 38,000 students in countries including Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Lithuania, and Austria. The curriculum was wide, including Jewish ethics, law, history, Hebrew grammar, and Bible. Students were graded and examined regularly. Uh, physical education, critical thought, creative expression were all encouraged and at the seminary level. Pedagogy, psychology, and other secular subjects were taught, including her favorite Polish and German literature. Schneer was married twice, first to Shmuel Nussbaum from 1910 to 13, a very unhappy marriage that she had been pressured to accept and maintain, ending in divorce three years later. The second was to Yitzhak Landau, which had happened at least by 1931. She kept her maiden name, of course, most famously, although many of her students, I don't think, are familiar with the whole history. Her recently discovered diaries add new layers to the story, in particular, her belief in the need for independence to accomplish her goals. Her vision, the revolution to strengthen piety and tradition as an independent woman, comes through powerfully in this passage from her diary. When I think about that, I just can't stop crying. But maybe I should be brave enough to say, no, I don't want to. Only you, you, my diary, allow me to express it all, even as you keep silent, stubbornly silent. And my ideal, somewhere in my soul, is only to work for my sisters. Oh, if only I could persuade them one day what it means to be a true Jewish woman who doesn't do things just because of her mother or because she's afraid of her father, but only out of true love for the Creator Himself, who has elevated us above all of the nations, and sanctified us with his commandments. Ah, if I could only manage to do that, I would be so happy, a hundred times happier than any millionaire. Have I lost my mind? Now, in this era of progress, I dream about something like that. Just the time she was being pressured to get married. She has a very famous teaching uh, from Perke Avot, the Mishnah Ethics of the Fathers, where it says, In a place where there's not a man, you should rise up to be a man. And she said to her people, to her women, if a place that there's no man, step up and be that man. Step up and do that job. Schneer passed away from stomach cancer in Krakow on March 1st, 1935. And since that time, her grave pictured here has become a place of pilgrimage for countless Beis Yaakov girls and women. And she herself revered as a saint. In fact, in many ways, she interacted with her students and disciples as a Rebbe, even during her own lifetime. Although there were innovative aspects to her activities, Schneer did emphasize the importance of traditional feminine values, such as modesty, faith, and motherhood. But in this light, the focus of traditional descriptions of her character, which acquire mythical dimensions within the circle of Agudas Yisrael, is on her feminine traits while ignoring other aspects, such as her organizational capabilities and leadership skills. But there was a revolution in this tradition or rather a revolution in the name of tradition. She was a passionate religious Jew, not maintaining as much as inventing a new religious culture for girls. Modesty, for example, meant for her simple dress, which as, was as frankly socialist as it was orthodox. As her biographer put it to me, Sarah Schneer may also have found success where others did not. 
because her new idea was clothed, as it were, in traditional garb. By all accounts, her traditional appearance and her unimpeachable piety reassured those who worried about the novelty of women's Torah study. Even the neo-Orthodox influence, which she was always careful to credit, did not come embodied in her case in the modern garb of the German rabbis with doctoral degrees. It came in her garb, her pious garb, that allowed this revolution to happen that was specifically located in Galicia and specifically from the conditions that Galicia produced. Thank you.